you will instantly know something's not right. Pay attention to that. I could name several in recent years who, like a shooting star in the Christian world, seem to arise to a place of popularity and fame and quote-unquote revivals and moves of God. And uh, people will uh, send me a video and say, you know, have you seen this latest great move of God in, in location X, Y, and Z and, and this prophet or this evangelist or this minister? And uh, just curious as to what you think. And within 30 seconds, literally, without exaggeration, within 30 seconds of listening to some of these individuals, you immediately, I immediately discern that they're false prophets. And again, I'm not going to go down a list of names, but I could give you a long list of names that many of you would realize. And with time, these people, as fast as they come, they depart. And then the scandals follow, and the sin follows, and the drug addiction, and, and uh, it's sad that Christians can be so vulnerable that just because somebody's popular, they immediately assume that they're theologians and they know how to dissect and teach the Word of God. Don't be gullible. All right. With that said, if you're taking notes, seven common views of the false grace message. Seven common views of the false grace message. There are a handful of people that I would call the progenitors of this subject uh, who in recent years have uh, been given such incredible airtime and popularity, as I've mentioned, talk shows and Christian television interviews, radio, internet, YouTube, and, and it's just amazing. Uh, one of them, when they hit that place of popularity and begin to ride that wave of, of media attention, their church went from 150 people to over 30,000 people. Preaching false grace. Because wouldn't we all love to believe that there's no responsibility on our end? No wonder people flock to it. People would love to hear somebody say to them, you can receive Christ and be saved, never lose your salvation, but it doesn't matter really how you live, God understands it all. Wouldn't it be wonderful? To just say, hey, I can live in my sin. I can take my time going through my problems. I can continue living in this sin or that sin. I can continue to propagate this vice or that vice. But I prayed a sinner's prayer with the pastor, and he said, by the grace of God, I can never lose that experience. Wouldn't we all love to believe that? But does the Bible actually teach that? Now listen, as we walk through these seven common teachings that are a part of the false grace message, I'm not going to go quickly. I'm going to go carefully, and I'm going to challenge you to pay attention. You know, many of you will sit down and you'll binge watch Netflix for hours, but you struggle to listen to someone who'll open a Bible and give you an hour of solid biblical teaching. I'm going to challenge you to, to discipline your flesh if you're going to follow this ministry, because I'm going to spend careful time explaining this to you and leave no wiggle room in your understanding. So with that as a title for where we're headed, seven common views of the false grace message, number one. Number one, false grace teachers maintain there is no need for a believer to ever confess their sins. And those that watch the live stream and are kind enough to write the notes out for others that uh, will come along after you, uh, thank you for those that, that help. Number one, let me repeat it, false grace teachers maintain there is no need for a believer to ever confess their sins. And they'll oftentimes say something like this, and and when I say it, you'll understand why it's so attractive. You'll understand why so many just take it in without thought or examination. But they oftentimes in their books, in their YouTube channels, in their sermons, in their teaching, in their interviews, you'll hear them say these exact words. They say, all of our sin, past, present, and future, 
has already been forgiven. So there is no need to confess it. Well, on the surface, that sounds pretty good. Isn't that true? Is that not true that all of our sins, past, present, future, have already been forgiven? No, it's not true. When you repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ, your past sins are forgiven. Your present sins, and I'm not going to get into the analysis and synthesis of verbiage as to, well, what's a present sin, but your present sins at the moment of your conversion are forgiven. But to say that all of your future sins are already forgiven is a perversion of what the Bible teaches. Let me give you a solid gold nugget. Don't ever forget this. Write it down. The only sin that God can forgive is repented sin. The only sin that God can forgive is repented sin. So for someone to say that all of your sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven, well, that's kind of a very deceptive statement because if you're thinking in terms of if I commit a sin in the future and I ask God to forgive me, He will forgive me. That's in the Bible, isn't it? Yes, it is. But to make it as an absolute statement, avoids other truths that are taught in the Bible about repentance, about confession, and about sin. While it is true that Christians have been forgiven by God, that does not mean that we are excluded from confession of sin. False grace teachers, by the way, they all have this as a common denominator. I've never heard one of them. I've never... uh, And when I say read, I I do some speed reading. I I don't spend, by the way, I never buy a book of of a false teacher. Never. I don't support false teachers, not even for research purposes. And uh, sadly, I don't have to because a lot of gullible Christians, when I travel, will oftentimes hand me their books and say, oh man, this changed my life. You need to read this. And when I read it, I thought, wow, I don't know what in your life was changed, but... uh, I think the only thing that changed is your IQ dropped about 50 points. If you read this and you found this to be life-changing, I don't know how many times your mother dropped you on your head as a baby, but we need to get back to square one and start fresh. People are so gullible and so deceived simply because they saw someone on Christian television and uh, bought a book. I'm very careful about all of the materials that we make available to you. I I was almost going to say never, but I I don't want to uh, catch myself in something that I don't have committed to memory, but I doubt there's ever been a time that I have offered you a a book that's not already in my library. Most of the things that I offer to you are books that I read and I found them to be so wonderful and uh, so biblical that I thought, you know, Christians need to to have that teaching. I mean, even uh, the book that we're offering this month, Before I ever ordered this in mass to make available, I had had that in my library and uh, probably just about everything Dr. D. James Kennedy has ever written uh, is in my library and has been read. I'm very careful about what we offer to you because I don't want anyone to be led astray by our teaching and by our ministry. I want you to be solid in the things of God. But these individuals will oftentimes say all sin, past, present, and future has been forgiven, all of them run into a major Bible hurdle that say that. They say you don't have to confess your sins. Only on the day of your salvation, that's it. The day you confess your sin, all sin, past, present, and future is forgiven. There is no need to live in bondage of confessing and worrying about everything that you do wrong. The grace of God covers it all. Well, they run into a major theological hurdle, and I think some of you probably know exactly where I'm going to go. 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, First John chapter 1, go down to verse 9. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all wickedness. This passage alone refutes the false teaching on grace. If all I did today was open up to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 and read this verse to you, listen to it again. But if we confess our sins to Him, God, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. That would be enough. How do you get through this? How do you tell somebody you don't have to confess sin? Because all sin, past, present, and future, has already been forgiven. How do you tell somebody that and then get to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9? Well, I'm going to tell you what they do with it. And uh, <laughs> anytime you're listening to a preacher or a teacher or an evangelist or a prophet or whatever, and uh, anytime they say, well, the Bible says this, however, that's not what it really means, your red light should be blinking. When I spoke earlier of God's help by the Holy Spirit to give you discernment over what is truth and what is deception. Anytime you hear anybody preaching from the Bible and they say, well, the Bible says that, but that's not what it really means. You should have double ears at that point. You say, all right, howdy doody, where are you going with this one? Because most people go through what I call theological gymnastics to get the Bible to, to fit what they're trying to teach. Well, you can't do that with that. But if you want to know how they uh, approach 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, do you know what they say? And uh, one of them in particular in my research, I actually came across uh, his word-for-word -word explanation of this. And I've heard it before, but I saw it with my own eyes. Do you know what they say? They get to this verse and they say, Well, 1 John was written to believers, but 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 the author John was actually addressing the Gnostics who were alive during that time. That's what they'll say. They'll say, 1 John 1 and 9, John was speaking to the Gnostics. And uh, that was a cult-like uh, group of people who did not receive salvation through Christ. They believed in enlightened truth. And I'll not get into an entire teaching on what Gnostics believe. That's not the point. But... That's what they'll say. They take this one verse out of 1 John and they say, yes, of course, you know, 1 John was written to believers, but 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, that, that little piece was uh, addressed to Gnostics and not to believers. But uh, when I heard that some time ago and researching it again recently, do you know what I found? Not one of them cite any commentary, cite any source, or cite any evidence and there's a reason for it. There is no source that backs that up. There's nothing that can be found anywhere to support that 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 was being addressed to the Gnostics in the early church. Of course, the Gnostics, uh, they predated the early church. They were around during the early church and, and subsequently. And uh, they were a cultish group and, and uh, again... I'll, I'll pause right there before I start running down the highway of what is Gnosticism. But that's how they address this. They say, you know, oh yeah, 1 John wrote that entire letter for believers. But verse 9, because that doesn't agree with my teaching on grace that all sins past, present, and future are forgiven and do not, be, uh, do not need to be confessed, you know, how are we going to handle verse 9? I mean, it just blatantly says if we confess our sins... He must have intended that to be for a different crowd. And so that's what they say without any evidence, without any sources, without any commentary. They just frivolously say, well, that's what it meant. Beware of people who take the Bible and go through all kinds of theological gymnastics trying to make you see something that's not clearly in the Scripture. One of the most fundamental ways to look at the Bible is God said what He meant and he meant what he said. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible's all simple. There are things in the Bible that even the Scripture says. We look through a glass dimly now, but when we're in heaven, we'll have full enlightenment as to all of the things. I mean, to tell somebody that the book of Revelation, just read it straightforward and you'll understand it. There are a lot of things in the book of Revelation because it's prophecy that 
people that are new in the Lord and don't understand the scriptures. They don't realize that Daniel in the Old Testament was a prophetic book that matched with the book of Revelation. And Paul wrote in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians prophecy and prophetic things that wove through that message. You know, a new believer doesn't understand any of that. Of course, why would God give us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers if we could do it all by ourselves? He gave us spiritual leaders that should help us in understanding the things of God. And of course, I've had the privilege of growing up in a pastor's home. My mom and dad were in full-time ministry until my dad's passing. My mother is 88 years old, still serving the Lord. I grew up in church. I've studied the Bible my whole life. And the Bible says, to whom much is given, much shall also be required. So for those of us who have had the privilege of studying the Bible our entire lives, we have a responsibility to help those who are new in their faith to begin to understand the things of God as well. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 again. If we confess our sins, well, highlight the word we. That eliminates the Gnostics. He said if we, he included himself. The author John included himself. If we... Believers, confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us. He includes it again, our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is absolute garbage to try to pull verse 9 out of 1 John in the first chapter and say he addressed that to the Gnostics when he clearly said, if we, us, I mean multiple times just in that one verse he makes it clear that he's speaking to believers. By the way, any time in the Bible you see the word if, then you need to pay attention because any time you see the word if in the Bible, that is what is called in theology a cause and effect statement. In other words, there's responsibility that's attached to what is about to unfold. Anytime in the Bible you see the word if, you might want to circle it or highlight it in your Bible as a little mental note as you continue in your study of the Bible. Anytime you see the word if, cause and effect statement. Something has to be done to produce the result. So in order for there to be forgiveness, what is the cause and effect statement theologically in 1 John 1 and 9? If we confess... He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The cleansing power of God, the forgiveness of God available is predicated by your confession of sin. So anytime you hear anybody say, you do not need to confess your sin, it's already been bought and paid for on the cross with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They have twisted the Bible and have entered into heresy and false teaching and are erroneous in what they're trying to purport. It just simply is not Bible. If you're still with me, give me an amen out there. Let's read on down. 1 John chapter 2, as long as you're open, let's go right down into 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. Let's pause right there. John is telling believers that you should not sin. There is not this wide interpretation of grace that no matter what I do, all sin, past, present, and forgiven, uh, past, present, and future is already forgiven. There's not this broad, generic, well, you know, I'm saved. I guess it really doesn't matter. I'm just going to try to be the best I can. No. Look at it again. 1 John 2, 1. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. The writings, the scriptures, the Bible has been given to you to prevent you from sinning, to give you a power over sin so that you can live a holy life, so that you can obey what God said when he said, be thou perfect even as I am perfect. God is our model. God is our example. God is the pattern of holiness. Though none are like God, though none can attain the holiness of God, that is the pattern and the model upon which we must build our faith. Not the average Christian in the church, certainly not the average person in the world. The scripture 
gives you power over sin. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. I mean, John is clearly writing to believers in 1 John, and he's writing to believers that he personally knew. And he went on to tell them that they should not sin, but if they do sin, you have an advocate. But you've got to confess those sins. 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins. You know, when I pray on a daily basis, Rarely, I hope there's never a time, but I'm just going to be safe and say rarely is there a time that I don't pray on a daily basis. Father, forgive me from all of my sins. Now, I don't live in sin. I'm not going out and committing sin. I'm not trying to uh, take the grace of God and make it a license for me to, to sin and then just run to God and say, God, forgive me. No, there's a difference, and we're going to learn that in the teachings ahead on the difference between purposeful sin and non-purposeful sin. There's a difference. Premeditated, willful sin, that's a different story. We'll get to that. But nonetheless, when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, how did Jesus teach the disciples to pray? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Sin. Forgive us. Jesus said, here's how you should pray. And when you pray, you should include confession of sin and forgiveness. James chapter 5, verse 16. I'll close with this. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. If we're told in the Bible to confess our sins one to another, we certainly would confess our sins to God because ultimately every sin is a sin against God. Let me say that again. Ultimately, every sin is a sin against God. So, well, God, I didn't sin against you. I... You know, I sinned against, you know, my neighbor. No. All sin ultimately is against God. Psalm 51. Uh, the psalmist David wrote in Psalm 51, Father, against you and you alone have I sinned. Well, he sinned against Uriah, committed murder, committed adultery with Bathsheba, failed his nation as a leader. It would seem that he had sinned against a lot of people. But what did he say in Psalm 51? God against you, and you alone have I sinned. He wasn't saying that he hadn't sinned or failed those individuals and committed those individual sins. He was not denying those other sins. He was clearly saying all sin, regardless of who you sinned against, all sin is ultimately a sin against God. And that's why all sin has to be brought to him in humility. And in confession, thank God for 1 John 1 and 9 that says, if we confess our sins, we have been called to holiness, we have been called to righteousness, but if in your Christian walk you sin and fall or stumble along the way, then know that you have an advocate in Jesus Christ that if you come to Him and confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Well, I didn't get as far as I'd like today, but I did tell you at the very beginning of this teaching that I'm going to be very thorough walking through it. Uh, we'll pick back up in part two on the seven common views of false grace teaching. Uh, today we got as far as an introduction, and uh, we talked about the first common denominator is that they say all sin, past, present, and future, is already forgiven. Therefore, believers in the New Testament should never worry about confessing sin. So there's error number one in that teaching. We'll come back to that in part two. 
and so glad for those of you that have joined us. I never share the gospel without giving people an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And what better verse to offer you the gift of salvation than 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you. Are you ready to meet the Lord? If Jesus Christ were coming today, would you be ready to meet the Lord? Are you living in victory over sin or is sin living in victory over you? If you're not certain of that, then I'm going to challenge you today. Centimet. Rồi mình trả lời T bằng 0 thì suy ra x 0. Tại thời điểm T bằng 0 đây, đồ thị nằm ngay đây luôn như vậy. Chiếu vào chục OX nó bằng 0. Rồi tại thời điểm 0.5 giây. 0.5 giây đây. Đồ thị ta đây chiếu vào nó bằng 2. Suy ra x bằng 2 cm. Rồi tại thời điểm T bằng 2 giây. 2 giây nằm đây. Đây là 1.5, đây là 2. Đồ thị nằm ngay đây như vậy nó suy ra x của chúng ta nằm ngay đây. Chiếu vào chục x bằng 0. Tại thời điểm T bằng 2,5 giây. 2,5 đây. Đồ thị nó nằm ngay vị trí này. Đúng không ạ? Chiếu vào nó bằng 2. X bằng 2 cm. Đúng chưa? Đó là xong cái nội dung của cái câu số à, à, số 6 của chúng ta. Được chưa? Thì các bạn coi coi. À, nếu có gì các bạn thắc mắc Các bạn không hiểu á, Thì các bạn cứ để lại bình luận Thầy sẽ giải thích cho các bạn à, sớm nhất Và cái file này Thì cũng để dưới cái phần mô tả luôn Bạn nào có thể tải về Chúng ta có thể tham khảo thêm Được chưa Đây là những cái bài toán dạng đồ thị Rất là cơ bản Dựa vào đồ thị chúng ta có thể xác định được Biên độ, ly độ, pha Vân vân Đúng không ạ ở đây thầy nói rõ thêm cho các bạn nè à, Nãy giờ chưa có bài toán nào nói về pha Ở đây thầy nói rõ Thầy có thể cho các bạn Thầy tìm pha ở cái bài toán này cho các bạn nha Thầy có một cái câu C nữa Là xác định pha ban đầu của dao động Thì các bạn làm sao đây Ví dụ như cái bài toán này Người ta yêu cầu mình xác định pha ban đầu